Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. God is good, and all the time. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? Let God see it. God bless you. As I told you a few days ago, let God know regularly that you love him. The fact that you're sitting where you're sitting is proof that God has kept you and he has kept me. So I thank God for bringing us through this week unscathed, unhurt. No accidents, no incidents, no tragedies. We thank him for that. And even if something did happen, we're still alive. Can you say amen? So we're very grateful to God, and I mean that from my heart. I am grateful to God for the gift of life. I can see you. I can hear you. I can fellowship with you. I drove with a pastor, no problems. We're still enjoying freedom of worship in a country which we know will soon put an end to freedom of worship based on prophecy. And so let's thank God as much as we can. Science, science has determined, this has been studied, that an attitude of thankfulness improves your health. Amen. These things have been studied by non-Christian scientists. An attitude of gratitude improves your health. No wonder the Bible says, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. All right, is there anyone with us for the very first time this week? Since we began, ah, could you tell us your name? John, John, nice to see you. God bless you. Thank you very much for coming. Say amen for John. Amen. Did I see another hand? No, I didn't. First time. You're here for the first time? John. What's the name again? John. Brother Jones, good to see you. God bless you. Anybody else? You're coming for the first time. Yes, my brother. John Jones. John Jones. Oh, the Jones family. All right. Good to have you. Say amen for the Joneses. Amen. All right. Uh, yes, sister. What's your name? Sister Collier. Sister Collier. Good to see you, Sister Collier. What does the church say? Amen. Oh, amen. Sister Collier. Is there another one? Another hand? First time. First time. First time. All right. Okay. Sister who sang? Are you with us for the first time? No. All right. Thank you for the lovely song. God continue to bless your voice. And may you use that voice to bring holy joy to the hearts of those who hear you. You know, as a, you look at all the great black singers, they all started in church. Are you with me? And then they left the Lord and went to sing for the devil. But they all started in church. Whether you start with Aretha Franklin or Marvin Gaye, that tells you how old I am. They all, Sam Cooke, they all started in church. Then after a while, they heard a few words of flattery, and they left to sing for the devil. If you have a talent, which, comes, which came from God, and all talents come from God, use it for God. You will not lose. Because what you do not get now, you will get in the life to come. When we serve the devil, he may give you things, but they only last so long. When you serve God, or most of what he has for you is in the life to come, and that will last forever. Amen. Don't focus on this and lose that. It makes no sense. All right. You had a good day? Amen. Good. You behaved yourself nicely? Yes. You prayed for your enemies? Yes. <laughs> you did. So you have enemies? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. The Bible says pray for your enemies. Yes. Your enemy may not change, but you will change. Amen. Are you following me? And this is true, pray for your enemies. Bless them that curse you, even in the church. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? There are people in the church who will send you to a mental institution. Pray for them. Are you following me? <laughs> the Bible says the wheat and the tares grow together. 
You don't find hypocrites in a bar. You find them in the church. Ah, you're not listening to me. You don't find hypocrites in a casino. You find them in the church. But you also find the saints of God in the church. Jesus said, have I not chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. The first church of the early church pastored by Jesus had a devil. Then why can't the church today have a few devils? Well-dressed devils. And so let us worship God with our eyes open. Our antenna always up. Because not everyone in the church building is a child of God. But you are the exception. Say amen. amen. All right. <laughs> okay. You know, the people who said crucify him, they were church members. Are you following me? The Romans said, let him go. Pilate said three times, I find no fault with him. The church said, kill him. Can you imagine that? It was Eve that told Adam, eat the fruit. His wife. It was Sarah that told Abraham, sleep with Hagar. His wife. <laughs> it was Rebecca that told Jacob, let's deceive blind Isaac, a wife and a son. Are you following me? It was Cain that killed Abel, a brother on a brother. It was Judas that betrayed Jesus, not a Roman. It is always the person close to you that can do the greatest damage. Well, let me stop depressing you. I just want you to be alert, but not paranoid. Don't be paranoid. Be alert, spiritually alert. I thank God for the pleasure of fellowshipping with you. I really do. I mean that from my heart. I really do. Up to this point, I have not had one complaint. Not one. I am staying in, my, in a palace. That's what I call it because I'm God's son. Are you with me? So when you're a child of God, you're a princess or a prince. As a prince, I'm staying in a palace. I told the pastor, anytime you get into your car, it automatically becomes a limousine. Because you're in it. Are you following me? Even if it has three wheels, it is a limousine because you are in it. And you are son of God. And God is a king that makes you a prince. So wherever you put your head to sleep, because you're royalty, it is a palace. Are you following me? And I'm not joking. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And if your father is a king, what does that make you? A prince and a princess. Then princes and princesses should behave a certain way. Are you following me? They don't behave like everybody else. You are a prince. When I was a little boy, there's an expression we use commonly called infradignitatum. It's a Latin expression which means beneath my dignity. Are you following me? And we were taught there's certain things that are beneath your dignity. It doesn't mean you're snobbish. It's just I don't do that. That is beneath my dignity. I don't drink. It is beneath my dignity. I don't gamble. It is beneath my dignity. Are you with me? I don't smoke. It is beneath. It is infradignitatum. Beneath my dignity. And for all of us, sin should be beneath our dignity. Our subject for tonight, make a U-turn. What did I say? Make a U-turn. Some U-turns are illegal, but not the one we'll talk about tonight. Make a U-turn. A U-turn takes you from north to east or west. To south, that's right. A U-turn takes you from north to south, or from south to north, or from east to west. Before I get into that message, let me make sure that my uh, phone is not on. If you are not using one of these, please make sure it's not ringing in the presence of God. Don't, don't lose the joy of handling a Bible. Are you following me? Don't forget how to do that. Huh? Handle one of these things. Yeah, we thank God for technology, but handle one of these things. I've said to God, Father, when I die, let me hold my Bible in my hand. Not the iPhone, my Bible. If I go preaching somewhere and they decide to kill me, I'll say, may I have my Bible, please, before you shoot? Give me my Bible, now shoot. Keep the iPhone, but give me my Bible. Don't lose the joy of handling. 
the Bible. All right, let's have reverence in God's house. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I really want to speak God's words. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together. If people would reason and think, they would not do a lot of things they do. If some people would think, they would not eat the things they eat. How can you eat a snail even though it's called escargot? Are you following me? A French name doesn't make it right. Are you, are you with me? It's a snail. Think. Think. If people would think, they would not attend the churches they attend. Step back and look at what's going on every weekend. Wait a minute, something's not right. Think. If people would think, they would not date some people they date. Think. Are you with me? What am I doing? Think. We don't think, and we end up in trouble, and we blame God. Think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, reason together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. It's a stubborn love, God. It's an elastic love. It stretches all the way around the universe several times. We thank you today, God, despite the fact that you're a big God, you take time for us individually. As we bow in your holy presence, Father, on the edges of the holy day, if we've offended you, forgive us, dear God. Cleanse us, Father, with the blood of your Son, that warm red blood. Cleanse us. Grant us a measure of your spirit that he may make the word clear to us tonight. I humble myself before you, dear God, and I ask you to use me. I am made of dirt, and I'm weak. You are my strength. You stand with me in this pulpit, Father. Don't leave me alone, because I'll make a disaster. It may be a beautifully spoken disaster, but a disaster nonetheless. Stand with me. Speak through me, dear God, and restrain my carnal nature. Restrain it. Father, bless everyone in attendance. We're glad for those who have come for the first time, touch their lives. A very special blessing on all the young people and those watching via the internet. Dear God, bless them wherever they are. Touch them in the areas of their needs as you determine those needs. If anyone listening to me has contracted the coronavirus, in the name of Jesus, and that name is power, that name is life, that name is health, in the name of Jesus, Heal those persons, dear God. I do not demand, I ask. I do not insist, I plead. I do not command, I appeal. Heal them, dear God, because sickness is not your will. Now I commit this service to your glory. Take all the glory, Father, and give us the blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Make a U-turn. Go to Genesis 2. One of my favorite Bible passages, verses 16 and 17. Before, you, before I read that, go to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8. I want to show you something. Mark chapter 8. I want you to read verse 33. I want you to read it quietly. Oh, you may read it out loud if you choose. Do you have Mark chapter 8? Yes. Some people still looking. All right. You have the King James Version. Read verse 33 of Mark chapter 8. Out loud, out loud. Verse 31, sorry. Verse 31, verse 31. And he began to do what? Uh-huh. Many things of the elders, the chief priests, and the, and of course, be killed and raised the third day. Okay, go to chapter 9. Chapter 9. Read verse 31. Mm hmm. 
Man must. Uh huh. Yes. Stop. What do you notice? It's the same thing. What is he doing? Repeating. Go to chapter 10. Read verse 33. Come on, read. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh huh. All right, you don't have to read the whole thing. Fine. What do you notice? He's saying the same thing again. Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter. Why do you think Jesus did that? He's warning them, yes. But why tell them the same thing, the same people, over and over again? Because they just couldn't get it. Those of you who teach, you know repetition is an essential tool of teaching. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I'm saying that to say this. What I'm about to tell you, I've said it so many times, but people don't seem to get it. Perhaps it's my fault. Go now to Genesis 2, 16, 17. It's 27 after 6. I got up a little late tonight, or not my usual time. We'll go to about 7.15. Is that okay with you? Yeah. All right. If the Holy Ghost tells me stop before, then I'll do that. Genesis 2, 16, 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God told Adam, don't do that. Are you with me? Don't do that. It was clear, unmistakable. Go to chapter 3. Let's read from verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, not because I was afraid, and I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, read verse 11 with me, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Come on, hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Now, this is what I've preached on over and over and over. Because the essentials of the gospel are simple like ABC. The problem is sin. The solution is Christ. The hindrance is the carnal nature, and the opposing power is Satan. The problem, sin. The solution, Christ, regardless of your culture. Your problem is sin. If you're Hindu, there are murders in the Hindu community. If you're Buddhist, there are murders. If you're Islamic, there are murders. If you're Christian, there are murders. If you're whatever, there's theft, there's greed, there's jealousy. All these things are found regardless of culture because the world has one unifying culture and that is sin. Now, you didn't hear me? The culture of the Buddhist is sin. The culture of the Hindu is sin. The culture of the Islamic follower is sin. The culture of the Christian is sin. In that sense, we're all standing on the same ground, sin. The solution to sin is Christ. Regardless of your ethnic origin or geographic location, the solution is Christ. The challenge is we are born with a carnal nature that hates all that Christ has to do. And there's a power that consistently opposes Christ, and that is Satan. Now, Listen to God in verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Simple English. Did you do what I told you not to do? You don't need Greek to understand that. Or Hebrew. Or college degree. You see, if God is not willing that any should perish, he must make the gospel simple because most people are not highly educated. He has to make the gospel simple for all ages. Amen. You did what I told you not to do. 
Parents, you understand that if you have children. Hmm? You tell your child left and he goes right. And you say, why did you do what I told you not to do while you have the switch in your hand if it's still legal in, a, in a, a Virginia? Are you with me? I grew up with a switch. Thank God for the switch. It was good for my spiritual life. God bless my mother resting in her tomb. Back then, no, no policeman arrested you for whipping your children. No. He would help you whip them. Did you do what I told you not to do? That's the problem. Let's go to verse 17 of Genesis 3. Well, let me pray. Fathers, I continue, give me simple language with the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Not just the ground where he was standing, the whole earth came under curse. Now, based on verse 17, why was the entire earth cursed? Because sin. That's a shortcut. Yes, sin. Let's stretch that out. Disobedience. Let's stretch it out. Because Adam did what God told him not to do. Sin, disobedience, absolutely correct. Sin is doing what God has told us not to do. Or sin is not doing what God has told us to do. It's as simple as that. On a practical level. Hast thou eaten of the tree? Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. The whole earth was cursed because someone disobeyed. Now observe. Go back to Genesis 2. Look at verse 16. Genesis 2, verse 16. Read that verse quietly and then take a guess. What word do you think I want to stress? Just verse 16. And don't take all night. Commanded. Commanded. All right. Go to verse 11 of chapter 3. Verse 11 of chapter 3. Read that verse and tell me what word do you think I want to stress? Commanded. Again. Go to verse 17. Read that verse and tell me, well, you already know the answer. What word do you think I want to stress? Command it. Now, what do we have then in the Garden of Eden? The commands of God. Mm -hmm. We are introduced to command in Eden. We're introduced to the fact that violation of command has no good side effects. None. Do you know why there's death? Come on, tell me. Okay, stretch out sin. Stretch out disobedience. Violation of the commandment of God. Do you know why there are floods? Violation of the commandment of God. Do you know why there's whatever you name it? Rape. Violation of the commandments of God. From then until now, it has not changed. Let's go to verse 21 of Genesis 3, our subject. Make a U-turn. Before we go to 21, let's observe some things that happened. Read verse 16 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Verse 16. Unto the woman he said, do you have it? Yeah. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and there's thy desire to be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This concept of men walking all over their wives is the result of sin. You see, spousal submission is a gift. Nobody heard me but one person. Men like to tell the wife, submit. The Bible says submit. You can't command your wife to submit. Submission is a gift. Mm -hmm. 
second point of fortify, submit. Mm. Submission is a gift because God does not force us to submit, and he's the ultimate spouse. This business of dictatorial husbands who think their wives have no minds of their own, that's the result of sin. The result of someone disobeying God. Painful childbirth. I've never given birth to a child, but I've been told that women curse sometimes. They curse their husbands who contributed to their misery. <laughs> hmm? Because it's pain. You have to have an epi, epi something, you know, to, to kill the pain. Epi, all right. <laughs> Sin. Now, let's look at verse 17. Why is the whole earth cursed? Someone violated the command of God. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. What does verse 18 say? In Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. Why do some trees have thorns? Sin. There were no thorns before sin. Are you following me? Sin affected people, vegetation, animals, and the ground. So it must have affected the air. When we breathe, we're breathing the taint of sin. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. Hard work for your living, that's the result of sin. Two or three jobs to stay alive, that's the result of sin. What? Someone disobeyed God. You name the calamity. It's because of sin. Now, let's go to verse 21 of chapter 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. What's happening in that verse? Yes, animal killed by Adam, not, not God. Come on, what else is happening in that verse? We have blood, we have a change of raiment. What's happening? Let's go to Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah 3, we'll read from verse 1. Our subject, make a U-turn. It's 20 minutes to 7. We have 35 minutes at most. Zechariah, find Malachi, work your way back, two books. Do you have Zechariah chapter 3? Let's read from verse 1. Do you have that? Yes. Let's pray. Father, teach me as I teach your people. In Jesus' name, I really ask you. Amen. Amen. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now read verse 3 with me now. Now Joshua was clothed with what? Filthy garments and stood before the angel. Keep reading. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with what? Change of raiment. Now, I ask you, what's going on in that passage that we just read? Here's Joshua the high priest representing sinful Israel. Are you with me? Here's Satan reminding him of his sins. The devil loves to do that. And so people doubt God's forgiveness because Satan's work is to remind you and to accuse you and tell you God cannot forgive that. And so we walk around with the burden of sin despite Calvary. And the word of God and God cannot lie. So we have the devil at his side to accuse him. Take away the filthy garments. What does that represent? Sin, the old person, sin, the life of sin. Take them away and say, I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Who clothed Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.21? God. Was it with different garments? Yes. Now, what's happening with Joshua? Repentance and forgiveness. Amen. Or what we call justification. They're being made right with God. Now, go back to Genesis 3.21. Did Adam and Eve stand with filthy garments, yes or no? Yes. What were they made of? Leaves. Anything that has sin is filthy. Did God have to give them new garments? Yes. 
So we know from uh, Zechariah that God had to remove the aprons of leaves and replace them with the robe of righteousness symbolized by the skins of that shed of the, the dead animal that shed its blood. What are we dealing with? Repentance, forgiveness, restoration. You're very courteous, so you say amen. But are you following me? Let me ask you this. Were Adam and Eve lost in the garden? Were they lost? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Anyone hiding from God is lost. Ah, let's go to Genesis 3. I have to go past 315 because you're not giving me the right answer. Let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Let's read from verse 7 of Genesis 3. Are you there? And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, why are they covering themselves? They knew they were naked. Read verse 25 of chapter 2. Nice and loud. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Something changed. Now, we have shame and embarrassment. What brings shame and embarrassment? One word, three letters, sin. Now, they are ashamed because of sin. But in 25, there was no sin, there was no shame. Something has changed. Now, shame is not a physical thing. It's a psychological thing. So, their minds have changed. Ah, I didn't say it clearly. How can I say it clearly? Did I say it clearly? Shame is not a physical thing. It produces physical results. So people's faces turn red and their mouths go dry because they're embarrassed. But embarrassment itself cannot be put in a glass and said, here's embarrassment. Are you following? Something changed in the mind. Now they're embarrassed. They're shamed because they're naked. Cover themselves. Read verse 8. I'm showing you they were lost. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Stop. What does the Bible say? They what? They heard. How many times have people heard the gospel and turned away? Because it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. Give me five more years to live this life, then I'll come to Jesus. They heard. You heard the seventh day of the Sabbath. Where are you going? You've heard return the tithe. What are you doing? You have heard it. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, what did they do? And Adam and his wife hid themselves. No saved person runs from God. A saved person is most comfortable in the presence of God. Can you say amen? They hid themselves. Now, let's go to verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I heard it. And I was afraid. Come on. Because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, listen to God. And he said, verse 11, who told thee that thou wast naked? In other words, someone else has spoken to you. Not me. Someone else has communicated with you. Not me. Because I didn't tell you. Look at the way you live your life. Is it God telling you or someone else? Who told you? I didn't tell you. Someone else must have told you. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Now, of course, the obvious answer is yes. Verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me a tree and I did eat. Now, Adam is blaming somebody else. A saved person says, I'm wrong. You didn't hear what I said. A saved person says, I'm wrong. Forgive me. Adam and Eve, hiding behind the trees, were lost, but with hope. Did you hear what I said? They were lost, but with hope. Now, go to Luke 19. When you study the Bible, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Go to Luke 19. Listen to what Jesus told Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verse 10. Do you have that? Read it for me. For the Son of Man is come to seek 
and to save that which was lost. Question for you, when did that seeking begin? In the Garden of Eden. Why? Revelation 13, 8, the lamb slain from when? The foundation of the world, the seeking of a sinner on earth began in Eden. By the way, if God does not seek you, he cannot save you. Because you will not seek him. Ah, I, you missed it, you missed it. You missed it, you missed it. There is nothing in the carnal nature that desires God. Is that clear? There is nothing. What did Jesus say? The flesh profiteth nothing. What did Paul say in Romans 7, 18? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. The flesh does not desire God. It desires church. But not God. So we go to church as a social occasion. You can show off the dress you just got from Walmart and you look nice. It's a social occasion for many of us. You don't need Christ to go to church. You need Christ to be godly. Are you following me? Adam and Eve were lost. Christ had to come seeking them. And since sin separates us from God, we know it's Christ who came, not the Father. Because Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And so this seeking began in Eden. But whom does Christ seek? Read Luke 19, 10 again. He came to seek and to save what? That which was lost. Now you tell me. When he came looking for Adam and Eve, why did he come? They were lost. But they were lost with hope. In those fig leaves, they were lost. But the moment there was a sinner, there was a savior. And the blood of Christ became effective even before it was shed. That's how powerful God's word is. 4,000 years before he actually shed his blood, the blood was effective because God does not lie. They were lost. So in 21, we have God reclaiming them. They came to him. He removed the leaves replaced it with coats of skins representing the righteousness of Christ. Adam and Eve repented. Adam and Eve, think of our title and tell me what they did. They made a U-turn. They made a U-turn. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Matthew. Chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 and 2. It's 10 to 7. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. You have that? Matthew wrote his gospel mainly for a Jewish audience. Luke for a Gentile audience. Luke himself was a Gentile. The only Gentile Bible writer is Luke. All others were Jews or Israelites. Do you have Matthew 3 from verse 1? Let me pray. Dear God, as I shift to this phase, stay with me or let me stay with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying what? Repent. Repent, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what was John the Baptist's mission? Prepare the way for whom? For Jesus. Is that clear? And we read that down in verses 3 and 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John was sent to prepare the way for someone who would come after him and also preach. John's message was, repent. You turn. <laughs> He's preparing the way. That's what he preached. Repent. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark 1. I look forward to seeing John the Baptist in the new world. Mark chapter 1, we'll read verses 14 and 15, our subject, make a U-turn. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying what? The time is fulfilled, come on. The kingdom of God is at hand. Come on, repent and believe the gospel. What did Jesus say? Repent. What did John the Baptist say? 
Why would both say repent? Because one prepared the way for the other. John the Baptist could not prepare one way and Jesus take another. Did I lose you? Both were directed by God the Father. God the Father chose John the Baptist to prepare the way for his son. And the way of preparation was repent of your sins. And Jesus came following in that preaching tradition saying repent. Not here's how to get rich. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go to Matthew 4. Read verse 17. Matthew 4, verse 17. What does that say? From that time, Jesus began to what? Speech and to say what? Repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, stop doing what you're doing. You're doing something wrong. Stop. If Adam had done right, I would not need to come and die. You're doing something wrong. Stop. John the Baptist said it. His cousin Jesus said it. What a Mark 6. Mark chapter 6. We read verse 7 and verse 12. Our subject, make a U-turn. Are you there? Read with me. What does that say? Verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over what? Unclean spirits. Now, read verse 12. And they went out. Uh-huh. Come on. And preach that men should repent. Who is that? The disciples. Now, let's rehearse. Not rehearse. Let's review. What did John the Baptist say? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus tell the disciples to preach? Repent. Because the problem is, come on, tell me, sin. And you said repent. Repent. Oh, I said it? All right. God bless you. Repent. This isn't rocket science. You're doing something wrong. You're thinking wrong. Stop. And you say, how? I have the power to give you. Your problem is sin. Not the pastor. Your problem is sin, not the conference. Your problem is sin, not your spouse. It is you. Sin. Jesus died. He rose. He went back. What did they preach after he left? Go to Acts chapter 2. Now he's gone. So they can do whatever they like. He's gone. No. Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches a tremendous sermon on the day of Pentecost, and he comes to a pause in the message. And in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, do you have that? The rest of you are still looking. Acts chapter 2, you have it? Read with me. What does it say? Now when they heard, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Mm -hmm. In other words, in salvation, there's something you ought to do. Verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter said just what Jesus said. And Jesus said what John the Baptist said. And John the Baptist said what the Father told him to say. So repentance came from God to John, to Jesus, the disciples while Christ was on earth, the disciples after he left. Repent. Go to Acts 3, another sermon from Peter. Acts chapter 3, just the next chapter. Verse 19, what did Peter say? Repent ye therefore and be Converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come for the presence of the Lord. Repent. Now, Peter walked with Christ. So you can say, well, he heard him say that. Fine. Let's go to a man who did not walk with Christ, but who was a disciple of Christ. Acts 17.
Acts 17, let's read 29 and 30. And you found it, say amen. amen. Come on, nice and loud. Read it with me. What does it say? For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. Now read verse 30 carefully. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. Stop, stop, stop. When you're ignorant, God overlooks it. He winked. That's what it means, you see. When you are, now, to be ignorant, you must have two things. I didn't know. I had no way of knowing. <laughs> you cannot say, as they said in 2 Peter 3, verse 5, of this they willingly are ignorant of. Willful ignorance is not what God calls ignorance. In the time of this ignorance, God winked at. Now finish verse 30. But now, commandeth all men, come on, everywhere to repent. What's that key word? Two key words in that verse. What are they? Command and repent. We are commanded to repent. Let's show you another, stra not strange, another command we never think of. Go to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Three minutes to seven. First John 3. I want you to read for me very carefully verse 23 of First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 23. Do you have it? Are you still trying to find First John? Find Revelation, work your way back. Revelation, Jude, Third John, Second John, First John. Chapter 3. Verse 23. What does that say? And this is his commandment that we should do what? Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Stop. What's the commandment? Believe in Jesus. This is his commandment that we should believe in Jesus. Acts 17 30. This is his commandment that we should what? Repent. God does not suggest we repent. He commands us. He can't force us. God doesn't suggest we believe on Jesus. He commands us to believe, but he can't force us. Let me introduce a concept for you. Think hard. Are we saved by faith or by works? Quickly. Faith. But what is faith? Faith. What's faith? Faith without works is what? What are the works? Give me one word. Obedience. Then what is faith? Obedience in action. Obedience is faith in action. Listen to 1 John 3, 23 again. Read it and listen. And this is his commandment, that we should do what? Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. We're told, I command you, to believe in Jesus. Are you with me? I command you to believe in Jesus. Now, just listen to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But what did 1 John 3, 23 tell us to do? We are commanded to believe. Then when we believe, what have we done? We have obeyed. Oh, come on, you're a little slow tonight. When you believe, you have obeyed. Because the condition of salvation is obedience. So when people say, by grace are you saved, forget the commandments. Uh -uh. By grace are you saved, yes. But faith is obedience. Obedience is faith in action. And so 1 John 3, 23, this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 says, whoever believes or whoever obeys shall not perish. Are you following me? Please say yes if you are. Let me go over it again, but I'll pray first. Father, let me cool down. Maybe that's why I'm not speaking clearly. Speak through me, dear God. You teach them, I'm just your mouthpiece. In Jesus' name, amen. What does God tell us in 1 John 3, 23? Believe. Does he suggest it? What does he do? So we have a command in verse 23 of 1 John 3. What is that command? 
believe in Jesus. Now, we're told in John 3, 16, whoever believes shall not die, perish, but have everlasting life. If there's a command to believe, and you believe, what have you done? Obey. You've obeyed. Now, read John 3, 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You finish it. Whosoever obeyeth. This is not salvation by works. This is salvation by faith. But faith is not faith if there's no works. Are you following me? The Bible says, if you love me, mm -hmm. remove keeping commandments, there's no love. God calls upon us, repent. Acts 17, verse 30. It's a command for the entire world. 1 John 3, 23 is a command for the entire world, and most people disobey. John the Baptist said, repent. Make a U-turn. That's what he said. Jesus said, because John prepared the way, make a U-turn or stop what you're doing that's offending God. The disciples preached while Christ was on earth, make a U-turn. Because he told them, preach it. When Christ rose, Paul was a central preacher. He said, repent. Peter continued the tradition. He said, repent. Let's look at God's message to the last of the seven churches. Let's go to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. You know, God sent seven letters to seven churches representing the history of the church from the days of Christ until this day. And the last, what are the seven churches, by the way? What are the seven churches? Name them. Sorry. Ephesus. Yeah. Come on. Smyrna. You're in a church, don't cheat. <laughs> Ephesus, Smyrna, come on. Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and us, Laodicea. Listen to what the church of Laodicea is told. Revelation 13, let's read verse 19. What does that say? Revelation, not 13, sorry. Revelation 3.19, you should have corrected me. Revelation 3.19, what does that say? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's the last message to the last phase of the history of the church. We are told, repent. That's us. We are the Laodicean church. There isn't an eighth church. So those who are ready to meet Christ will come out of this Laodicean church. Be zealous, therefore, be active about it, be serious about it, and repent. Let me put it in my own English. There's something you're doing that's wrong. Jesus says, come on, talk to me. Repent. Or, according to our title, make a U-turn. Five after seven. I am your brother in Christ. You've heard me tell God I'm weak because I am. But a preacher has a job to do. I don't know how you can get rich. I, I don't know. Ask Benny Hinn. I don't know. <laughs> Creflo Dolan, uh, the others. There's something you're doing that's wrong. You need to stop. Mm -hmm. Is that easy? There's something we are doing that's wrong. And we know it's wrong. We still do it. And come to church and sing very loudly. What is the message of Christ to us tonight? Repent. Or say it differently. Or say it differently. Stop what you're doing. This is no joke. I don't want to depress you tonight, but people die every night unless it's different in Virginia. People die every night. Don't die with that thing unconfessed. Any time you put your head on a pillow, be sure you're right with God because you do not know if you'll open your eyes. Bad people die, 
righteous people die. Are you following me? I'll say it one more time gently. There is something we are doing that is wrong. You're in a relationship you shouldn't be in. Break it off. You're working on Sabbath. Stop. Start returning the tithe. Stop destroying people's character behind their back or in front of their faces. Amen. You have no time for God's word. Make time for it. You are constant irritation in the church. By God's grace, try to be a blessing. There's something we are doing that's wrong. And Jesus says simply, stop or repent or make a U-turn or obey. Here's my appeal to you. Is there someone listening to me who needs to stop something? It could simply be always being late. I don't care what it is. Don't think I think of murder and suicide and genocide. Whatever it is, it makes no difference. All Adam did was to eat a fruit. That's not murder. He just consumed a fruit. Might have been a little grape. The whole earth was cursed. Because sin is like a rust spot on your car. If you don't attend to it, it will spread. Are you following me? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of hell is also like a mustard seed. It starts small, and if you don't take care of it, it grows and your life is possessed by the enemy. If there's something you're doing, you know it is wrong. You put it at the foot of cross, Christ tonight. Tonight. Can I see your hand? Oh, God bless you for honesty. Stand up. Stand up. Now, I have never seen a joke in the Bible. There's no, there, there are no jokes in the Bible. So we're serious. You think COVID-19 is bad, you try sin. You've risen to say, there's something I'm doing I need to stop. And God has heard you and registered your commitment. The power to stop is this. You'd be amazed how many Christians have little time for this power. This is what created the universe. He cast out the spirit with his word. Now you're clean through the word. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. This is the power. Because the very life of God is in his word in some mysterious way. Let me say it one more time, then I pray. You and I have risen to say, there's something I am doing that I need to stop. I need to make a U-turn. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I will give you 30 seconds to talk to God and place that thing at his feet, then I will pray. Father in heaven, we confess there's something we're doing that's not right. It may not be catastrophic, it may not be big, but all sin is dangerous and deadly. We've committed tonight, dear God, to place that thing at your feet and to make a U-turn. The decision is ours, but the power is yours. You've commanded us to repent, Acts 17.30. You have commanded us to believe in Jesus, 1 John 5, 23. The choice is ours. Forgive us for that thing we've done for years. We thank you for the message tonight that has opened our eyes. By your abiding grace, dear God, we now place that thing at your feet. And we ask you to give us strength tonight to avoid it. 
If we open our eyes tomorrow, Father, give us strength for tomorrow to avoid it. Let us make it a daily commitment to stop doing that thing by your grace and your power, and the power is in the word studied and obeyed, as your servant tells us in Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1, if studied and obeyed. The word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute, every single one. And so, Father, accept our commitment tonight, dear God, and help us to leave that thing behind. Because at your command, and the words of your Son, and your chosen apostles, we have decided to make a U-turn. Bless our efforts with success, dear God. And when we stumble and fall, take us by the hand, lift us up, and let's try again. Hear this humble prayer, Father. I offer it from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Now, closing hymn. 313. 213, my mistake. 213. And what's that? He certainly is. He really is.